Hello, and welcome to the first episode of the Doctor Who Literature Podcast. I'm Jason, your host. I'm here to talk to you about the Doctor Who novelizations, largely put out by Target Books from the early 1970s through the early 1990s. These books were nominally aimed at kids, but they've taken on a sort of immortality, and there are still Doctor Who novelizations being published up to this very day, with the distinctive multicolored Target Bullseye logo on the spine and front cover. I have been reading the books since January 1985, only about two months into my Doctor Who fandom. On my now largely defunct blog, Doctor Who Novels on WordPress, drwhonovels at wordpress.com, I talked about my origin story with the books and posted a series of reviews, some brief capsules going in random order, and then longer form, almost page-by-page analyses of the first dozen or so books, which I wrote in late 2016 and early 2017. For this podcast, I'm going to go largely in publication order and talk about the books from a literary standpoint. There will be some storytelling along the way, mostly in terms of my own individual experiences with the books and how my physical copies over the years have taken on the outward characteristics of my own fandom, with footnotes, corrections, crossouts, cast lists, and the occasional sarcastic comment. My basic thesis and the reason for my adding yet another Doctor Who podcast to the landscape is that the Target books have extraordinary literary merit, particularly those books written by the titans of the series, Terence Dix, Malcolm Hulk, and, for two pre-Target books in the mid-1960s, David Whitaker himself, the show's first script editor. Of course, along the way, we'll reach Terence Dix's somewhat maligned late 1970s output when he was churning out six or eight 100-page volumes a year, but I'll have some surprising opinions about those books, too, if and when we get that far. And frankly, some of the books, in the 1980s especially, are poorly written turkeys. But, as Doctor Who fans, they're our poorly written turkeys. Certainly, I still have all my novelizations, the complete set, and they've followed me from my childhood bedroom on Long Island, through two cross-country moves to California and back, and they still live in my bedroom today. So even the bad ones are worth talking about, and talk about them we shall. Let's get to it. Doctor Who, in an exciting adventure with the Daleks, by David Whitaker, published November 1964. So here's a true story, and I've probably told it before. It's so embarrassing that it has to be true anyway, because I wouldn't make up a story that makes me look quite so weird. But when I was about 12 years old, so we'll say mid to late 1985 or early 1986, I found a copy of the novelization of the Daleks on my mall's bookstore shelf. I was elated. I hadn't seen the story on PBS yet, but I knew that this was like the holy grail of my burgeoning Doctor Who novelization collection, or whatever the holy grail equivalent is for a kid a year away from his bar mitzvah. Naturally, I bought the book, and then returned it. An hour later. Before we even left the mall, during some endless clothes shopping trip for my mother, I guess, in some other store... I flipped the book open and I started reading, chapter one, and it was all wrong, made of lies. So, The Daleks was one of the first three stories to be novelized, printed by Frederick Muller in the mid-1960s during the initial burst of Dalek-fueled Doctor Who mania. The editorial choice was to not begin the book in media race, as did the TV story, but rather to start off with an origin story. And since they didn't have the rights to Anthony Coburn's script for An Unearthly Child, the actual origin story, David Whitaker just went up and made up his own origin. That's why the first two chapters of Doctor Who, In an Exciting Adventure with the Daleks, as the thing was originally called, bear a very little relation to what we actually got on screen. In Whitaker's alternate take on the origin story, Ian is not a happy-go-lucky, pop-music-loving teacher at Coal Hill School, but rather a disaffected schoolmaster who'd rather have a scientific research job at an engineering firm. As he drives home from a failed interview one night, 
He's confronted with a car wreck in Barnes Common. Not that at age 12 in New York, I would have had any idea what Barnes Common was. He meets a blood-soaked survivor who turns out to be Barbara Wright. Barbara was driving Susan home in the fog, and their car was hit by a runaway army truck. And that driver's corpse is described in some detail, too, by the way. Barbara here is not the stern Coal Hill School mistress, but rather a burned-out secretary and substitute teacher or tutor who's been hired on through a newspaper ad to become Susan Foreman's full-time history instructor. Except Susan Foreman here is called Susan English, and we don't learn much about her in these first two chapters, except that, as in the original TV broadcast, she's shockingly well-informed about some areas of Earth history and comically inept at others, such as believing Japan to be a country and Scotland. The Doctor is still about as sinister as he was in the original stories. Here, Barbara faints immediately upon entering the TARDIS. Ian then trips over her, bumps his head, and blacks out. The Doctor dematerializes while the two are unconscious, and briefly keeps them prisoner in a bedroom until the ship lands. He's just about as patronizing as you remember him from TV, but he also rifles through Ian's pants pockets and reaches Holmesian deductions about the man's dismal career prospects. Whittaker also takes the opportunity to expand the TARDIS design, with a series of glass pillars lit up in rotating colors and making the console room set even bigger than it was on television. Oh, for what might have been on a proper budget. The TARDIS then lands on Scaro. Ian is finally persuaded that they're on another planet, although Whittaker also tells us a couple of times that we're not even in our home universe anymore. The next universe but one, the Doctor says. The most interesting narrative conceit here is that Ian is the narrator of the book, and the whole thing is told through his first-person POV, which will lead to some interesting deviations from the original TV story, once we get to the parts of the book adapting the seven episodes of the Daleks properly. the jump, we talked about how David Whittaker used the first two chapters of the Daleks to add a non-canonical origin story for Ian and Barbara. This means that the actual text of the seven televised episodes of the Daleks are confined only to the back eight chapters of the novelization. As with the first two chapters, the rest of the book is quite well written, but the whole thing is still a markedly different beast than the TV story. It's as excellent, but for very different reasons. While this was the very first ever novelization, and although Target reissued it in 1973 as soon as they acquired the Doctor Who print license, the book style obviously is not representative of what the typical Target novelization would come to look like. For one thing, just about all the Target books, excepting those written by Donald Cotton about 20 years after this one, would come to be written in the third person. Also, a significant number of the Target books were 12 chapters long, deviating most typically for six-part or longer stories, with the TV cliffhangers located roughly every three chapters. But David Whittaker is the first, and he has no mold to follow or break. If you're coming to this book after years and years of Terrence Dicks, you'll find that there is no third-person narrative, no easily divisible number of chapters with clearly delineated cliffhangers, 
In fact, this book pretty much eschews the cliffhangers altogether. With Ian as the narrator, the book does resemble the televised version in terms of plot breakdown, but much less so in terms of scene-by-scene -scene action and dialogue. For example, because the cliffhanger to episode one on TV featured Barbara encountering a Dalek on her own, you know, the one with the Jackal and Hill screaming most terrifyingly at a sink plunger, the cliffhanger that's considered in fan mythology to be the moment that put the show on the British cultural map to begin with, doesn't appear in the book at all. The book's solely from Ian's POV, he's telling it, and he wasn't there for that scene, so the moment just doesn't exist. And yes, when I was 12, I wrote the cliffhanger into my copy of the book in pencil, just couldn't let it go, and evidently still can't. Similarly, the cliffhanger to episode two, which features Susan alone in Scarrow's dead forest, menaced by an unseen pursuer, is here told only in flashback. The moment is there this time, but buried in mid-chapter, and not particularly dramatic, especially as Susan's telling it after the fact, so we know that there was no real moment of peril involved in the end. Another side effect of the decision to tell the book as Ian's narrative is that we get no Dalek-only scenes, such as the kind featured heavily in the middle and later episodes of the serial. Instead, we see the Daleks only through Ian's eyes. Ian senses their malignance from the very beginning, but they're still kept ambiguous, faintly menacing but not actively evil, until the later stages of the story, when they set about on their plan to reclaim Scarrow by exterminating all of the Thal people. Except that the planet is not called Scarrow here, by the way. Whitaker leaves it nameless. The episodes 3 and 4 material fly by in print at double speed because Whitaker has again excised all non-Ian scenes. Any material from TV featuring the Thals earnestly discussing their future with one another, or featuring the Daleks monotonously plotting and scheming against the TARDIS crew is gone. In place of those scenes, we get some unexpected angst. On TV, Ian helps the travelers escape from their prison cell, and then sends them off to safety while he unsuccessfully tries to prevent the Dalek ambush of the surviving Thals. In the book, however, Barbara is infuriated by how Ian dismisses her, and spends most of the rest of the book in a blind fury, giving him the silent treatment. This puts Ian in the awkward position of spending the second half of the book wondering just why Barbara is so angry. I quite enjoy this bit of real-life relationship angst, which Whitaker will resolve nicely at the end. It's something you just won't see happening anywhere else in the target line, and it certainly didn't come from the TV story. There are two other major deviations from the televised material. First, this version of the Doctor lacks a lot of the mannerisms which William Hartnell brought to the part. This Doctor refers to Ian solely as Chesterton, but never gets his name wrong. Not the way that Hartnell chose to do in almost every scene. Next, Whitaker reworks the Daleks' origins. On TV, Nation had the Daleks as descended from the race of Dals, D-A-L-S, who were said to have been benevolent philosopher kings before the war. When Whitaker ghost-wrote the eventual Dalek Chronicles comic strip under Nation's name, this origin was junked, and you won't find that origin in the book either. The book was, if memory serves me right, written contemporaneous to the Chronicles, but Whitaker doesn't include his Chronicles uh, version of the Daleks' origin in the books either. Instead, he leaves their origin a complete mystery. What's not a mystery is Chapter 4. That's right, Whitaker calls it The Power of the Daleks. Two years after the publication of this book, he would recycle that title. And very effectively, too. I'll give you a quick note on pronunciation. I know it's not pronounced Daleks. I know in England they're called Daleks. I just feel kind of self-conscious saying it that way because it's not the American accent. So I know that every time I say Daleks, I'm saying it wrong. But after 48 years of living here in the States, I just can't say it any other way. It would sound pretentious. I apologize. Conventional wisdom is that episodes 1 through 4 of the Daleks is a very different story than episodes 5 through 7. The first four episodes involve the TARDIS crew largely on their own, going up against the Daleks for the first time. The back three episodes, on the other hand, have been compared to a Flash Gordon serial, with Ian and Barbara separated from the Doctor and mounting their own expedition. This notion is highlighted in Whitaker's novelization, which is told solely from Ian's point of view, like I said. This portion of the book is completely Doctor-free, and almost equally utterly without Dalek.
Instead, it features Ian trying to herd cats, a team of reluctant doll adventurers who are more vivid in the book than they ever were in the corresponding scenes on television. Barbara, of course, is still mad at Ian and barely talking to him, which leaves Ian to become an action hero in his own right. The episode 5 material is an interesting object lesson in how Whitaker used Nation's TV scripts as a mere jumping off point rather than as something to transcribe directly. Ian tries to goad the Thals into taking defensive action against the Daleks, and does so in the book by staging a boxing match between Ganatus and Antidus, brothers, using Queensbury rules, of course, and this ends with a comedy pratfall. The material where Ian threatens to steal Aladon's fiance and bring her to the Daleks is ported over from the TV version, yes, but Aladon's response, an impassioned speech to the Thals as to why he's choosing to fight the Daleks, is far more lush and poetic than the version of the same speech which Nation wrote for him on TV. Nation's words are actually moving and well-delivered, but his dialogue trends more towards the functional, whatever you could fit in 25 minutes of recording at Lime Grove D, whereas Whitaker is writing 151 pages, at least in the Target reprint, and he's going for imagery, poetry, metaphor. But I have found a new responsibility, Aladon says in the book and that is to exist. We were born to survive, not to die, and living is a much harder thing to do than dying. I say to myself, why even struggle against the elements, the scorching sun that has ruined our crops and made us travel in search of food? Why not just sit down in that sun forever until we burn away or die of thirst? I say to myself, why even battle with the soil to grow things? I realize that all life is a struggle. Meanwhile, for the first time in the book, Whitaker actually uses one of the TV cliffhangers, the death of Elion by the lake monster, at the end of episode 5, to end a chapter. All the previous cliffhangers were either hidden in mid-chapter, or, as I said earlier, eliminated entirely. And then comes the Ian and Barbara romance. In chapter 7, Whitaker strongly intimates that Barbara has fallen in love with Ian, and that's why she's treating him so coldly. In a narrative twist, the Doctor and Susan recognize this fact, it seems, even while Ian doesn't, thus putting the reader a few paces ahead of the narrator, which is always a good place for the reader to be. Why is she being so unfair? Susan cried out at last. The Doctor patted her arm and started to follow in Barbara's footsteps. She isn't being unfair, Susan, my dear, he said quietly. Miss Wright is asking questions, and that is a different thing entirely. What questions, Grandfather? I don't understand. Neither did I, for that matter. So I listened carefully as I could, without giving away that I was in any way interested. Oh, she knows the answer already. The trouble is, she doesn't believe it. I saw a look pass between the two of them. Then Susan glanced at me. She said, oh, I see. I didn't know what they were talking about. The episode 6 material consumes less than a full chapter of the book. Chapter 8, the wonderfully titled The Last Despairing Try because Whitaker just chucks half of it out. All the Doctor, Susan, Aladon scenes, leading to their capture by the Daleks, gone. That long fight between brothers Ganatus and Antidus, seemingly put in the TV script for the sole purpose of getting the episode to 24 minutes long, gone. In fact, all of Antidus's petulant cowardice and fear of the dark, gone. Antidus has only a minuscule part in the novelization as a result. Instead of padding, Whitaker fills the void with real meat, Christus, an incidental character who spoke only a handful of words in the TV serial, becomes a major character in the novelization. In print, he's a gentle giant and wise philosopher. He talks about the evil nature of violent death, and how everything that Thals do is a struggle. The sun will be a worthy opponent, he declares, before free-climbing a rock face in the searing scarrow heat. If you read the episode 6 transcript, you'll note how sparse and functional the dialogue is. City of Death Part 2, this most certainly is not. Now, this is not to say that Nation is a bad writer. Sometimes the writer's job is to get out of the way and let the production crew get to work. But where there was lots of slow-moving adventure on TV, because it takes a lot of effort to turn Lime Grove D into miles and miles of tunnels, Whitaker pairs the material down to size and replaces the deleted Doctor and Dalek scenes with two tense and completely unfilmable action sequences. Christus scaling the cliff face, and fight against first one, and then twenty or thirty, creatures from the Lake of Mutations. 
Once Ian and Barbara and Ganatus and Krista survive the episode 6 cliffhanger, there's a lot more danger in store for them, both in the caves and inside the Dalek City, much more so than on TV. Here, they have to climb through a 20-foot tunnel, a narrow 20-foot tunnel, and then dodge a phalanx of 20 Daleks as they explore the city, including the Daleks' extensive weapons workshop and hydroponics workshops, two sets that even the great Raymond Cusick himself could never fit inside Lime Grove. Ian's ultimate two-pronged strategy. He and Christus will destroy the Daleks' master control room, while Aladon and his team do as much damage as they can elsewhere in the city is more detailed and impressive in the book. Something new that we also get here is the Glass Dalek, Whitaker's early take on what the Daleks' ruler should look like. Later on TV came the Emperor Dalek and the Dalek Supreme, but here it's a mutant in a transparent glass Dalek case. This Dalek doesn't speak in a monotone, but rather squeals his orders out to the assembled Dalek units. Ian smashes him to bits, with a Dalek claw arm. Not a sink plunger, by the way. The conclusion of the book is also different in tone, and quite so. After the plot has been disposed of, Barbara has to work through her burgeoning romantic feelings for Ian, with an assist from Christus. But Ganatus's crush on Barbara, the key feature of the closing moments of Terry Nation's Episode 7, is utterly absent from the novelization, as is Ganatus's personality. In the end, the Doctor offers Ian and Barbara a chance to stay behind on Scaro, to help the Thals rebuild their world. A charming moment, which would not have fit into the TV story arc of the time. In fact, the Doctor is much more expansive here, staying behind for a Thal feast in the Time Traveler's honor, and dispensing a few more words of wisdom than Hartnell did on TV. The closing scene of the Daleks is the first time that we saw Hartnell adding his personal charm to the role of the Doctor, and Whitaker does not shy away from highlighting that charm. Looking back, this is a pretty special Doctor Who book for a whole bunch of reasons. It's the first novelization, the first of many, in a long line of novels that are still, as I record this in November 2021, still being churned out today. Since there was no mold to break at the time, Whitaker spares no expense in rearranging and improving the original TV scripts, which were no slouch themselves, and adds persuasive details, more action, more adventure, a nascent romance, and a lot more meaty dialogue. Given the choice, all this time later, this is clearly not a book that I'd ever return to the store again for a refund. Will the second book in the series be able to top the first? Next time, Doctor Who and the Zarbi. Spoiler alert, no. No, it won't. So my copy of the book, after I returned it in 1985, I ended up relenting and buying it probably a year or so later. This is the 1983 Target reprint, so it has the uh, 1970s Season 11 through Season 17 Doctor Who logo. It does have the original Target cover, which is Hartnell standing in front of the TARDIS with two Daleks over his left shoulder. The TARDIS is sort of a purplish color, and Hartnell's face is uh, shrouded in yellow, while you can see a universe of stars and planets and asteroids highlighted against his black frock coat. One Dalek is tinted orange, and the other is tinted blue, and the blue one is spitting fire at the bottom cover of the book. This is a 1983 reprint. It says that the original is 1964, the target version is 1973, and then reprints in 77, 79, 80, 82, and 83. You can learn a lot about the success of the Target line just from that copyright page. I mean, this is a book that was printed seven separate times in less than 20 years. And this is 1983, so it's going to be reprinted several more times in other editions over the next decade, including the eventual Blue Spine edition. What's interesting is that I think this is right before the Target books really took off in the U.S. On the back cover of the book, it gives the price in pounds, Australian dollars, and Malta. There's no price code for the United States. This is, I think, before Lyle Stewart got the license to distribute the books and printed his business address and the U.S. price, $2.95, on the back cover. It's also categorized as children fiction, whereas I believe later books will be science fiction TV tie-in rather than children fiction. And there is no number on the spine. I believe the numbering came about starting in 1984, and this was probably the last Target reprint before the books got renumbered. 
My version is pretty well read and pretty weathered. Uh, the book is entirely white, although I'm holding this book now 35, 36 years after I bought it, so it certainly has its fair of damage and creases and dinks along the way. The white has been faded and dirtied, so there are gray and purplish blotches and what I can only imagine are food stains, because this book spent a lot of time at the breakfast table with me mornings before school started. It also rode in my backpack on the way to school several times, so the corners are dinged up. The moment that I'm least proud of is probably the fact that I went back, like I said, and I wrote that first cliffhanger um, in pencil. So, obviously the pencil has faded quite a bit, but at the bottom of page 56 is the moment where the Barber cliffhanger would have been. And I wrote in pencil part two, and then I added in parentheses written in the 1985 version of my cursive handwriting, the Barber's Hall leads her to a Dalek. That's all I wrote. Uh, that was a meager attempt to put the cliffhanger in the book for future reads, and I wrote in pencil rather than ink, so most of the, the graphite has completely faded away with the passing of time. For the rest of the book, I also marked off uh, the cliffhangers. Naturally, chapters 1 and chapter 2 were not in the book at all, so on top of the chapter 3 heading, which is page 39, I wrote part 1. And, of course, it was never even called part 1 at all. It was called The Dead Planet. In subsequent Hartnell novelizations, I would start writing out the actual episode title. So, for example, I would say A Holiday for the Doctor rather than Part 1, or I would say uh, The Death of Doctor Who for Episode 5 of The Chase rather than Part 5 or Episode 5. Even though I returned this book to the bookstore, um, it has given me a lot of value over the years. My parents did not understand my Doctor Who obsession when I was 12 years old. So I gave this book to my father to read, and he understood it, and he liked it, although, of course, he never asked to read another one. But here we are, 36 years later, and it's one of many, many, many targets that still live in my house and have followed me across country twice, and I can't imagine a time when I'm ever going to be getting rid of my copy of this book. Thank you for joining me on this first episode of the Doctor Who Literature Podcast. I'm Jason, your host and editor and producer. You can find me on Twitter at Doctor Who Novels, that's DR Who Novels, and you can also find me on the Trap One podcast. Please drop me a line or a comment with your thoughts, your questions, your suggestions. Next time, we'll be discussing Doctor Who and the Zarbi from 1965. Thank you for listening, and keep turning the pages.